When Luann and I originally conceived the idea of doing an Iowa-based secular progressive podcast, we had a few working ideas, and all of them were founded on the tragic mistake of assuming that Donald Trump would lose the election. We were going to spend a lot of time talking about latter-day movement conservatism, the aging, decaying forest of ditto heads, fundamentalists, Fox News zombies, tea partiers, half-baked objectivists, and lost causers that had provided the fertilizer for the Trump movement to grow and eventually metastasize within the White House. There is a slim hope that the Electoral College will do the only constitutionally useful thing it can do and prevent a Russian-appointed Manchurian candidate from assuming the power of the executive branch. Barring that, the Trumpocalypse is upon us. For our first broadside, we want to be crystal clear on a few issues up front. To start with, we want to get into specifics on what we think this election means. Because I don't believe there has been a politician in my lifetime that has exhibited a worse set of character and intellectual traits and characteristics than the man who is about to assume office. To start with, Trump displays the characteristic of incuriosity, a habitual indifference if not downright hostility toward facts and evidence. Trump will deny plain facts about his past statements, about his business dealings, about his lack of political acumen, and whenever possible, no matter how lurid and uncomfortable the tap dance around reality becomes, he will try to diminish the seriousness of the things he stands accused of doing, believing, claiming, or supporting. The reasons for this behavior are pretty obvious. Both progressive and conservative writers, intellectuals, and politicians, in a rare feat of bipartisanship, have labeled Trump a, quote, pathological liar. It's not that Trump merely lies to distract his followers from the truth about him. It's that he lies even when there's no clear reason to do so. For Trump, lying is a compulsion, something he can't resist doing, like groping women or tweeting. He lies when it's convenient. He lies when there's no benefit. He lies about his lies and then lies about it. And his lying isn't even the half of it. You can add to the dark triad of incuriosity, pathological lying, and stupidity, vindictiveness, pettiness, hostility toward women, hostility towards people of color and other cultures, a childish temperament coupled with an overwhelming sense of entitlement and self-importance, boorish, bullying, an orange, ferret-headed narcissus who has never expressed any interest in anything beyond himself. So what do we think about all this? That this man is about to assume the presidency represents for us a low point in American cultural life, a historic blunder, a political Iraq or Vietnam in a long series of them. And we're more than a little concerned about the damage this idiot may do to the country and worse, the idea of democracy itself. Why did this happen? It's simple, so don't get distracted. 62 million people voted for a con man, and that's what Trump is. A grifter, a bullshit artist. You've heard the expression, he was born on third base and thought he had a triple? Trump was born on third base and thought he invented baseball. 62 million Americans voted for an obvious, blundering con man. So easy to spot, three-fourths of so-called conservative radio hosts could do it in exactly that language. But there's a dilemma in this. A con or confidence man is a kind of economic predator who is named the way he is exactly because his method of predation is to first gain the trust and confidence of his victims and then exploit them in whatever way he can. When it's seen in this light, the Trump voter is not just a vessel of racism and rage, but a carefully selected target, a mark, a rube, who was caught unawares and will likely suffer some of the worst consequences before they discover the confidence man never really had a diamond mind, there was no Nigerian prince, and he really wasn't going to restore the lost kingdom of Atlantis or bring the jobs back from overseas. Nevertheless, you pulled the lever. No one forced you into that voting booth. In doing so, you provided Trump the presidency, a Congress and Senate neck deep in corporate money, the Supreme Court, which might have actually restricted the effects of money in politics, a cabinet filled with millionaires and billionaires, corporate executives, Wall Street financiers, oil men, war profiteers, climate deniers, and political stooges. The Trump presidency will be the final reckoning for the American right wing. You have the keys to all the doors. You own this every minute of every day. Don't look our way for sympathy. If we believed in sin, we'd say that's what you've committed, and we fear there will be a heavy, if unheralded, price to be paid. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. I'm a whiner, and I keep whining and whining until I win. Maybe somebody will rise up. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty.
Welcome to Swing State, an aggressive, progressive, critical, and political podcast from the middle of the Midwest. I'm the Wayne. I'm AJ. This is episode one. Welcome to Swing State Show. I am your host, AJ, and this is my pal, LeWayne, the working class skeptic. We are so happy to have you here with us today. The first thing we want to do is pimp our Twitter, our Facebook, everything like that. So follow us on Twitter at Swing State underscore show, facebook.com slash Swing State Show. Our website, where we have blogs and other hopefully interesting things, swingstateshow.wordpress.com. And of course, when you want to send us hate mail, it's swingstateshow, all one word, at gmail.com. Please do send us your hate mail. We would love your hate mail. Delicious, salty tears. Actually, we'll find out whether or not we really love hate mail, but that's beside the point because it'll be a while before anybody hears us to hate us. That's true. So anyway, so what are we doing? Well, we're doing a political podcast. If you've seen our promo before, uh, you know that we were just kind of going to talk about politics in general because there's not enough of those, I guess. Um, A dearth. Yeah. And then Donald Trump got elected and we had a whole bunch of stuff to say about that. Boy, did he ever get elected. And uh, as you as you heard in the broadside, um, AJ had a lot of stuff to say about that, and a lot more to say too. We're not done. We're not. We're not even. Th- that was that was warm up for anyone who doesn't know us personally, which is pretty much everybody in the audience, I'm sure. Uh, we are actually in a swing state. We're in Iowa, which in 2000 was super blue, and this time around was not. Not exactly. Not exactly blue oasis. No, not even a little. Um, here I was watching Texas thinking, oh, God, it's going to actually turn blue. Oh, just kidding. When I should have been paying attention to what's going on here, which is kind of our point. We'll talk about politics at a national level because it's sort of unavoidable. Because right now we're looking at Donald fucking Trump as president-elect. But we're also going to look at local politics because ultimately all politics is local. I, I don't know who to attribute that to because I know I got it from somewhere. But it is. In terms of local I mean, obviously, things like even your school boards, your local ledge, all of that stuff. But it's 2016. In two years, there's going to be a whole lot of congressional seats that are going to come open. And we need to make the state blue again. In fact, we need to make as many states as possible blue again. I'm a registered independent. I am not a Democrat. I don't belong to the party. But right now, the way things are, we have two options, red and blue. And... I kind of have to side with the party that doesn't hate everybody I know. Well, when you put it that way, the choice becomes fantastically simple. That's right. Well, it, as we said in the intro, or we uh, implied, or you know, we said it, we said it. Um, we believe that a, a very substantial part of the state has been taken in by what amounts to a con man. And the evidence, by the way, for that is mounting by the day. Um, some people find it difficult to label Donald Trump as this, or, as this or to see him as this because he he lies and changes his mind and backpedals so often that it's just seen as an extension of his personality. But it's not. Uh, he really is putting the CEO of ExxonMobil, or he's going to attempt to put the CEO of ExxonMobil in the State Department. He is going to put a climate, quote-unquote, skeptic, whatever the hell that is, in charge of the EPA. We are facing some very, very serious things coming down the pike as progressives, even as centrists. I mean, this government is about as far right-wing as you can imagine as it's shaping up now. Uh, you, you have a who's who of billionaires, corporate lobbyists, oil people, financiers, the whole lot. And this state is not necessarily on board with all of that in the way people may think if you're not from here. There is not a great love of Wall Street in Iowa. There is not a particular love of the oil companies in Iowa, or eminent domain use or abuse in Iowa. There are all kinds of things that progressives can rally around, all kinds of different issues, that if we just simply get off our asses and get together and get serious and get working, the same way, by the way, that the conservatives work, they work. They work to make these things happen. They work at voter suppression. It doesn't just happen. It's not magic. They actually get up every morning and figure out where they can introduce voter ID laws to increase their own odds of getting elected. That's the motivation. Don't let anybody tell you anything about voter ID crap. That's that's all bullshit. It's because they want to be elected. Then they work at it. They're persistent. It's amazing how persistent they are. We need to be even more aggressive and resourceful. And here's an aside with regard to voter suppression and voter IDs. The most frequent argument among the right is that this is about 
protecting the integrity of the elections, to avoid voter fraud. Here's the thing, and Iowa gets to take credit for this too, which is fantastic. The first reported incidents of voter fraud were in Iowa, and it was a Trump voter. Make America great again. Yes, because one of the things that Trump has managed with, and it works in this state, I know it works throughout the Rust Belt, the Midwest in general, everybody mistakes his braggadocio, his his lies, his pompousness as plain truth. They take this as a guy who who's who you see at face value. They they have a sense of Donald Trump as this towering success figure. A person who tells it like it is. He's a successful businessman. He's a straight shooter. He's not from Washington. He's by definition somehow great. But then when you actually look and you begin to examine the figure and you look at his business dealings, you look at how he conducts himself, you look at how, how many of his businesses have failed, this guy went broke in the fucking casino business. It's the only business I've ever heard of, except for maybe a charity, where people walk in and give you free money. They give you free money. You are statistically, uh, you, you design the system so the odds are you will always make money and people will walk in and give it to you for free. And he managed to go bankrupt in that. He changes his mind about everything by the day or never meant it or was just saying it for attention or whatever fucking excuse is put out the next day by his supporters. Yet, nevertheless, they maintain he's a guy who just tells it like it is. It can't be both. This is the absurdity of the Trump era we're living in is people are talking out of both sides of their mouth all the time. Uh, AJ called me the working class skeptic, which is actually uh, my Twitter handle. So if you happen to look for me on Twitter individually, it's WC underscore skeptic. Um, I chose that name deliberately because I do literally have a blue collar job. I actually wear a shirt with my name on it and the collar is blue. And I am constantly amazed by the people around me that I work with who work physical jobs, who work hard jobs, who are the people everybody keeps claiming that somebody like Trump appeals to or represents or represents. And it takes about two seconds with Google to figure out that Trump has made a habit of screwing the working class. He has failed to pay laborers. Screw and sue the Trump method. And yet this is the guy that people look at as some sort of working class hero. I'd like to say I, I, I literally don't understand it, but I do. Um, because at the end of the day, a lot of the people I know don't have time to waste looking at politics. They don't have time to waste looking into the background of these people because they're busy working their ass off to make a living. I don't say that as an excuse. It is an explanation. Yeah, that's what this show is going to be a lot about, is it's going to be trying to bring people in Iowa, particularly, information, arguments, other things that, I mean, if you watch cable news, for example, if, if you're one of the folks, the unfortunate folks, who absorbs your daily news from a television set, I mean, I don't want to say anything too condescending, but I just want to say that hopefully this show can do, can do you a little bit better as far as substance is concerned. Because what, at least what I witnessed, and I'm pretty sure Luane would agree with me, during the election was, I mean, it, was, it was like the most brainless, ridiculous, absurd, and never-ending charade I've ever seen. What, what passes for presidential debates, debates in the United States, what passes for, for reason, thought, and discourse around here these days, is shocking. It's shocking. And you know where else I see the same kind of thing? On Fox News every night. On CNN, who's got the moderator, so-called, in the middle, the two political hacks on the left, the two political hacks on the right. They all scream at each other, and they can never, ever form a consensus about anything because they're not there to do that. They're there to yell and scream and to get ratings. That's what drives these networks. Right. And here, here's the thing. We're not going to tell you we're doing all the work. All you have to do is listen to us and do what we say because that's basically what everybody else is telling you. That's why we're losing. Yes. Um, because what, what we're actually telling you is you're going to have to do some hard work. We all are. And that's going to start with you and us 
looking at our sources of information. You cannot just read something and take it at face value. You can't listen to guys like us and take us at face value. If we say something and you think, well, that sounds odd, you have to look that up. You Please have do. to pay attention. Please do. Please, Please correct us. If you, if we make an obvious mistake, yeah, you've got the email. You know Sunday how to get a hold of us. Email.com. Please. But here's the thing. Being skeptical is hard. It's not just it's it's not just a matter of eh, I don't believe it. You can't just not believe it. You have to look into it. If there's anything you get out of this show today is that you cannot take anything at face value. You have to learn. You have to think. Yes, it's time consuming. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's a challenge to get useful information. In order to respond to a tweet that somebody replied to one of my tweets with, with regard to Pizzagate, I did a quick Google search. The first three pages of Google results were all right-wing articles, articles in air quotes, claiming to have the facts about Clinton's involvement with a child molestation and trafficking ring based out of some pizza places in D.C. And just just to, to say those words together and to not instantly have a red flag raised in your mind when you hear a claim like that, that Hillary Clinton is involved in a sex ring run out of a pizza joint. I mean, if no part of your brain goes, well, wait a minute, that smells like bullshit, then we've got some work to do. I don't know how the reddest red stater could hear a statement like that and not at least think for a second, that seems a little odd. Mm. And yet, what happens ultimately is still nothing. The right-wing loudmouths pushing the story don't have to deal with anything resembling truth or fact or anything. Nobody calls them on it. And until something like an idiot walks into one of those pizza joints and discharges a firearm, do any of these guys even think for a moment, eh, maybe I shouldn't be saying stuff like that? Let's just take Fox News as an example because it's a particularly egregious example in the cable infotainment, corporate infotainment business, um, which by, I, I don't really consider cable news networks as such to be news exactly. Uh, that that may be an accidental thing that they produce on occasion, but that's certainly not what they're designed to do. What they're designed to do is make money by any means necessary. They will advertise whatever products they have to advertise. They will say anything they have to say. They will, they will kowtow to whoever they have to kowtow to just to keep the money flowing. And if you're on Fox News and you're like Bill O'Reilly and you're caught red-handed lying about facts, about you know, distorting or making up things, this was a huge scandal. Please go back and read the articles about some of Bill O'Reilly's you know, fake reports in El Salvador and other places and, and related to the JFK assassination, where he just makes these bombastic, ridiculous claims. And then he is found out. Is he kicked off the air? Does he get the Brian Williams treatment? No. No, of course not. Of course not. He's there the next night. That's the thing that we're talking about. And listen, it's not just us on the left that's talking about this phenomenon. There are plenty of right-wing radio hosts that I've listened to and some, some I even respect on a certain level, even though I have many disagreements with them on a lot, a lot of different things. But at the very least, they're recognizing, they're starting to recognize, hey, wait a minute. We just had a network, Fox News, the country club of the GOP for the last, well, I guess since 1996. So it's going on 20 years now, or whenever it was started, I think it was 1996. In case you didn't know, here's a newsflash. It was run by another sexual predator, Mr. Roger Ailes, who... Night after night, day after day, pumped his Nixon throwback vision of republicanism to his anchors, and they they put that smog out willy-nilly for the following 20 years. And there has not been any consequence, like we were talking about before, no consequences whatsoever for the network. Just as many people watch it, even if they hate it, they watch it. They're still getting their information from it. It just it boggles my mind. I mean, I've I've unplugged when it comes to, to cable news and the, these things. And I suggest people do the same, not just to listen to our show. I mean, please, God, do, do your own research. But we have an information problem in this country, and I think that that is one of the first and most important things that we need to understand and appreciate and ultimately fix. And then going off of that for our next segment, we want to talk about, uh, 
we want to talk about the state of the Democratic Party. And we want to get a little specific today. We're going to play you a clip from uh, Mr. Keith Ellison, who is a congressman from Minnesota. He is being backed by Bernie Sanders for the Democratic National Committee. I think it's the chairmanship is what you call it. Um, it is a very important position within the Democratic Party because it essentially this guy is going to lead the progressive left. He is the, the leader of the, uh, of the progressive caucus in the House of Representatives, which means that his election to the chair will mean that, the, that the, the progressive left is finally ascendant in the Democratic Party. We've finally taken over. It's a new day. And so here's a clip from him, and we will chat about it after. We got to include everybody and we should use moments like this and technological moments like this because basically it's not about the technology and the software. It's about us, the people, and we got to include everybody. And if technology can help us get more folks on the table, well, then let's do it. Y'all all right with that? Yeah. The Democratic Party should be the party of the people. The Democratic Party should be the party for those who want a better future for their children and grandchildren. It should be a party that invests in workers, protects their ability to organize, and fights for a fair wage and good working conditions. The Democratic Party should be a party that believes everyone should have equal access to the American dream and equal rights before the law. The Democratic Party should say, it doesn't matter what your color is, we're going to treat you with fairness and equality and respect. It doesn't matter who you love and go to bed with at night. It doesn't matter who your closest of kin is. They are your choice and we respect and honor that choice. That's who the Democratic Party should be. The Democratic Party should say whether you were born in America or whether you came here, we respect you, we honor you, and we want to see your families come together. The Democratic Party should be that, that party. We believe that the Democratic Party should be the party of, by, and for the people. We can bring that change that we need. We can stand up to Trump and the Republicans if we get involved and if we remake this party right now. But I also believe that it is absolutely time for a very serious injection of energy and reinvigoration. Unity is something that must be fought for. It's something that must be struggled for because we all have our ideas about how things should go. So we need leadership who's going to say we're going to stick together and stay together and hammer it out and maybe cuss each other out a little bit. But at the end of the day, we're going to come out holding hands and being a team. This is the kind of thing we got to have. We need a 3,141 county strategy. We need a strategy that gets granular. We need a block by block. We need a precinct strategy. We need a strategy that gets right down to the nitty gritty. Because you know what? The resources of the Democratic Party need to be moved right down closest to the voter. That's where they need to be. I'm talking about the money, the training, the data, the resources need to be to the people closest to the voter. But I can tell you, city officials and state legislative folks and local county people and just grassroots rank and file do not feel like they are being heard or listened to or included. This is a fact. I'm just telling the truth. And if we want to win, we will listen to our local officials and our grassroots rank and file people. We got to get small. All right, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Keith Ellison. Um, just to react to that real quick, I, I mean, I have to say that when, when I heard that Bernie Sanders had picked a candidate, obviously we were both pretty excited yeah. that, that we had a, a pretty early uh, definite figure to kind of rally around and get behind. And, you know, of course, like most people, I didn't know that much about Keith Ellison um, before he was brought up for, for this position. But having had a chance to hear him speak and research him a little bit, I mean, I couldn't be more excited about the direction of the party right now. I mean, this, this, is, this is what we needed. We needed somebody to bring in a shot of enthusiasm and somebody who, frankly, just he, he gets it. He understands the model we just used to run a presidential candidate to defeat Donald Trump, who, by the way, in case you didn't know, was the absolute easiest candidate I have ever Absolutely. seen. I could not if I if I could design a candidate who I wanted to run against a beat, it would essentially come out of the factory looking like Donald Trump. Everything from the fake hair to the fake machismo, the fake everything. Everything about the guy is just absolutely fake. We could have beaten him easily, but somehow we managed not to, despite having all the money in the world. The a ground game had a map of the entire country block by block, street by street, and we still managed to lose because the party ignored. 
the the needs of working class people for one their concerns particularly in the so-called rust belt which by the way another part of this little clip that you didn't hear was keith ellison saying we should actually stop referring to it as the rust belt he wants us to start calling it the industrial midwest which is what it used to be and uh that's also why i included part of the clip um where ellison's talking about workers and their ability to unite and their ability to be protected um by unions and and the like because uh, those are particularly relevant to me um, as a person, as, as an actual laborer, and as somebody in the Midwest who got to see that how, the, how this all happened the first time around in the 80s. Okay? Yeah. Watching farms go away, watching industries go away. These are all important things that, that tend to get ignored when liberals are talking about this stuff, except as an abstract thing particularly when they're really establishment liberals like Hillary. Hillary was the wrong candidate for a variety of reasons. The biggest one, justifiable or not, is that she cannot relate to anybody who does not have a six-figure income or higher, who does not do things like go to the opera, who does not do things like have their own driver. People who have to fix their own cars do not understand how they can be represented by somebody like Hillary. It's why the Democrats shafted Bernie so badly and shafted themselves so badly by cutting him out in favor of their anointed one. Because Bernie appealed to these people. Because he spoke a language that, first of all, was far more eloquent than Trump. No kidding. But actually resonated with the same thing. The only difference was Bernie's message was inclusive. It was, it was not just all of the workers. It was all of the workers, all of the people, don't care where they're from, don't care what their color is. And that's the difference between his message and, well, there's a lot of differences. That was one of the biggest differences between his message and Trump's about the worker. He really meant everyone, and he should have been able to walk over somebody like Trump with no difficulty. No, I think he, he probably almost certainly would have just absolutely, I mean, he would have taken so much of Trump's industrial Midwest base of voting support, the thing that eventually lost the election for Hillary Clinton, where she wasn't campaigning up to the, up to the election. It, what Bernie Sanders was talking about was it's not necessarily like a ditching of identity politics. We, we, we hear this a lot, how people, we, we need to stop talking about identity politics. I don't think that's true. I don't think there's any reason for liberals to stop talking about the plight of African Americans in the United no. States today. There's no reason for us to stop talking about police brutality or what we're seeing, what we saw at Standing Rock and may yet have <laughs> to deal with when Trump becomes elected. But what Bernie Sanders was talking about, his message was primarily economic. And this, yes. is the this is the socialism and democratic socialism. What he's talking about is there has been a massive transfer of wealth from the working class, from the industrial Midwest, where the good jobs used to be, where the unions used to be, where the high-paying jobs used to be. That has all gone away. Why? So that the financiers on the coasts can make more money. Right. It's not really more complicated than that. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of details, but that, that is the end result, and that is what Bernie Sanders was talking about and what Hillary Clinton completely ignored in favor of being the president for everyone. The problem is the everyone ultimately is still the, the privileged everyone. Okay, we have, we have Bernie, who's an old white guy, who by, by most measures should be the, the exact opposite of what you want cosmetically as a, as a candidate because everybody has been the old white guy okay the difference was his message was not the old white guy message the the problem then with hillary was her message still kind of was the old white guy message and um it, it was liberalized because she's a democrat kind of mostly sort of yeah, whatever she 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 was still an old school democrat and i don't think that you can have that work in the 21st century there there are too many people who need the democrats who don't look like hillary who don't look like uh howard dean who don't look like the guys running the party or who at the very least have some intention of doing something about the trade policies or have some, doing something about the fact that we're offshoring jobs and we're automating jobs without having any idea what we're going to do with the workers 
who are already working there. It's we, and the thing about this is is that the sort of the neoliberal period that we're talking about, where we have the the, the leaving of you know, for instance, the auto the auto industry just abandoned in the United States. These things have a cumulative effect. You know, it starts in the 1980s. Does it hurt? Sure, it does for the people who are losing their jobs, but not as much as it's going to hurt in the 1990s when you can compound it with more offshoring and more job loss and more people making less wages or whose wages are stagnant or being cut while, meanwhile, the cost of living is raising for everything from gas to groceries to you name it. I mean, this is all practical stuff. And then that compounds in the 1990s into the 2000s where you can add tax cuts to the rich, wars, more wars. Uh, and the, the Republicans now, by the way, and currently are, are thinking about what to do about Iran because we didn't already figure that out. So, I mean, just everybody put put this all in a historical context and try not to lose sight of what what has been happening to the middle class of this country. And it's not over. Right. It's not over by any means. But but here's here's the thing. And this is this is why it matters for the Democrats in particular to have the middle class on their side. There's a reason why we use terms like the one percent to yep. describe the wealthy people and the ninety nine percent. Just in pure numbers, there are more of us. We just didn't bother to show up. Yeah. Because we didn't care because, oh, fuck, it's Hillary. <laughs> and, and it cannot be that way. And that's why it's important to take Allison's message that it has to stop being top down. Yeah. Okay. It has to be, it has to be bottom up. It has to be ground, grassroots. It has to be. The people that you know, the people in your neighborhood, the people you see literally being hurt by Republican policies, these people need you because they're not getting the help from the top. They need you. They need us. They need their neighbors. They need their friends. And they need to come together as a community. And that community needs to vote and get mobile because in case you haven't seen a map of what's the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party is looking out on the state legislature governorship level. Ladies and gentlemen, massacre is not too difficult of a word or too or too crazy of a word to use for what we're what we're seeing here. Despite the fact that okay, so we talked about earlier in the show, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by two and a half million votes. You would think being in the majority would translate into, you know, perhaps your party at least being even. It doesn't. <laughs> it it does not. It does not translate into that. Republicans control far, far, far more than, than the popularity of any of their ideas uh, would make you think. And kind of as an aside, I, I mean, this, this isn't really exactly what we're talking about, but when they start to cut Medicare and Social Security and all these things, you're going to find a whole lot of people who maybe even voted for Trump suddenly going, oh, wait, because they didn't know. How they didn't know, why they didn't know, I mean, that, that's a subject maybe for another day. But the fact of the matter is we, we need to listen to what Keith Ellison is saying here about a, a, a county strategy, a precinct strategy. This is not – This is we, we, our best shot coming up is not the presidency. It's the Congress. We don't need to wait to 2020. We don't need to wait till tomorrow. We need to get organized today, getting ready for the next elections that we have so we can take back whatever we can take back, however – you know, whatever a pittance it seems to be. At least we need to do that much as soon as possible. That's the advantage we have. We have numbers because it really is everybody. There, there, there are people you know who are red, and they always vote Republican. But if they really knew what Republicans were doing to them, if they were really aware of it, if they, if they operated outside the, the sort of right-wing media machine, it, it, it would be one thing to tell your friends, oh, no, no, the Democrats are this, or no, no, they do this. One of the things... AJ and I are both uh, non-religious, okay? We don't have uh, a, a guidance from God as to how we operate. We have to operate basically on the what does the least harm and does the most good. We weren't always uh, non-believers. Um, when I met AJ, he was still a hardcore believer. And I couldn't, I was not going to talk him out of that. I just showed him this is how I am. This is how people like me are. And I'm not taking credit for his transition, but I'm saying that you cannot, you can't do what we're basically doing, which is tell Republicans to go fuck themselves. That's not going to work. You're not going to be able to convince them that what, what is happening to them is happening. You cannot convince them 
that your side is the right side, you have to show them. You have to be the person they need. And they need to know that the person they needed was not red. That the person they needed, the one who helped them, the one who protected them, the one who represented them, the one who made sure their life was as good as it could be and not how, you know, based on how much someone could squeeze out of them. They need to know that that person is, if not a Democrat, then at least a liberal. They need to know that they are not Republicans, they are not red, they are not the people that are doing them the harm, they're the people that are trying to do them the good. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, don't know. You have to try it. We have to try that. I mean, that, that's that that's the thing is that this show is also about is like what, what what Luane and I definitely don't want to go to our graves saying is that we didn't do at least something. We didn't try something to turn back the tide of this. Basically, what it's kind of an economic theft. I mean, it's legal because you know it's it's the tax code. It is what it is. But when you look at the the real effects on real people's lives of what happens when you just cut corporate taxes down to fifteen percent, or if you cut the top the top marginal tax rate from whatever is thirty nine percent down to thirty three or thirty, well, ladies and gentlemen, that is real money that's not going to be available for real programs that real people need. That for see for us, this is not all theoretical. I mean, a lot of our drive and passion for this comes out of our our knowledge of of actual people living real lives who are struggling like crazy, and what benefits are available. It's it's a joke in some cases, ladies and gentlemen. I know I know a mom with three kids struggling to make it by. You'd think that in our society, the richest country in the world, we would have some program, some way that if this person is willing to work full time, that they won't have to worry about paying a car bill or they won't have to worry about paying their heat. We don't live in that country, and the way to change this is for each of us on the grassroots level, like Keith Ellison is saying, like Bernie Sanders is saying, we all need to get active, and we need to let them know that we're there and we're not going anywhere. And that means interacting with Republicans. That means interacting with your Republican congressman. Call them up. Let them know how you feel when something's going wrong. Um, we'll be talking about all sorts of strategies and different things we can do as the show goes on. But um, for today, for our homework segment, the thing that if you want to do something this week right now to get ready for what's coming down, go find out who your state legislators are. Go find out who your congressman is. Don't, don't worry about calling 50 people. Find out who your senators are. Find out who your governor is. Find out who your state legislators are. Find out who your congressman or woman is and get ready to call them. Not email, not tweet, call. Because we're going to need to talk to them to start with in a very polite way, obviously. We don't want to, you, you, you don't need to broadside them. Um, Here, here's, here's the thing. When you contact these people, and I think we mentioned it in one of the blogs, particularly if your candidate is one who just took their position. Congratulate them. Let them say, hey, it's yeah. great. I'm glad to see that you're in this job. You know, I hope you're, I hope you're, uh, you're genuinely representing all of the people because I'm one of them. And here's why. I want you to know about me. I need you to know my story. Because part of the problem is they don't. Yeah. Okay. The average congressperson does not interact with anybody in their constituency directly except really in 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 structured ways you know when they when they do a press conference or or when they're out campaigning you're going to have to do the work you're going to have to go to them because they're they're not going to come to you and you can't wait for them to come to you but you don't have to be an asshole when you deal with them yeah maybe they're not the party that you would have wanted in place they are in place and just like dealing with your your racist uncle fred <laughs> you cannot, you can't go at them head to head. You got to work with what you know about them. And that only happens when you interact with them. So yeah, congratulate your, your, your local politicians. Okay. Hey, I'm glad you're in here. Here's what you need to know about the people you represent. Will it work? Eh, I don't know. You'll find out. But what won't work is not doing anything and not being motivated to do anything. Because here's the other thing about this. The Republicans already know that how the grassroots work. They already have people motivated at the ground level all the way up. And if you need any proof of that, look at the state of Texas. Yes. Look at the state of Texas and specifically look at textbooks for schools in the state of Texas. If you're, if you're bored this week and you want to look at a story as to how grassroots affects the nation, look at Texas, right look there. at school boards, look at school textbooks. Because here's the thing. Politics may seem boring to you. 
and it may be I, it may be boring to think I don't want to be on the school board, but you know what? The people who are on the school boards, they're motivated, and they're not motivated to help you. If you want them to be, that has to be you. You have to do that. So when we say grassroots, we mean find a political position and fill it at whatever stage you can do it. It doesn't require you to be a politician to be on your school board. And that, that's, that's an important point right here, ladies and gentlemen. If the election of Donald Trump has taught us nothing, if it has taught us one single thing that is good, it is that you do not have to be even, even all that intelligent, let alone qualified, let alone rich, to, to run for some office and, and fill it. All you need to do is just go out and try because there's a better than even shot in a lot of these unopposed elections. You, know, you, you never even know what could happen. So you know, please, if you're in a position where you feel like you've got some spare time and you feel like you've, just got, you've got a calling, as they say in the church, to, uh, to get out there and to serve in some capacity, please do because one thing that progressives don't do we don't show up in midterms, and we don't seem to think that the petty stuff matters, which is why we lose, yep. and we keep losing. So at the end of the day, and we'll kind of wrap things up here, your homework is find out who your representatives are, contact them, and maybe take a look at what positions are going to be open. Take a look around you. See what needs to be done, and whether or not you can do it, or if you know somebody who can do it, whatever it takes to have an impact. Because the one thing we cannot do, if anything, if, if there's anything else we got from this other than literally anyone can be president, you cannot wait. You cannot let somebody else do it. You have to do it. We had such an insanely low voter turnout for this election. Well, it was, it was embarrassing. Embar the cradle of democracy. Just go check out what those numbers were. You have to do the work. We have to do the work. And you have to do the work. We have to do the work. We can't wait. We can't hope somebody's going to do it. Hoping, praying, wishing, that doesn't do things. You have to go do the work. And the first thing you have to do is get enough of an education to do it. You have to know what work needs to be done. You have to get out there. You have to interact with the people you know the people who are around you, the people who are important to you, the people you may not even like, but they're part of the community that you exist in. And th this can be something as simple as, you know, Keith Ellison is talking about uh, going forward, we're going to have to have a lot more meetups for secular progressives around the country at the party level. We're going to need to have lo local people getting together to talk about what needs done. And so, I mean, look, nobody's expecting you to become, you know, Julius Caesar overnight here. All we need to do, pick an issue. Whether you want to legalize pots or, you know, whatever, you want to get speed cameras taken off the interstates here in Des Moines, pick your issue, try and educate yourself about it, read what you can about it, and then look for meetups, find other progressives, like-minded people. I think we will all be amazed how smoothly this can go if we just get to it. Because here's the thing. If you're hearing our message, you have access to technology. If you have access to technology, you have access to everything. You have access to education. You have access to other people. There's In the 21st century, there's no excuse for you not to be involved that, that, that doesn't involve you just simply not being involved. Yeah. 45% of, of eligible voters not showing up to the polls. We've talked about third parties. We've talked about all sorts of things. You know, who, who's to blame for this? I mean, there's, there's a lot of levels of blame <laughs> to go around right now. It's certainly not just the one thing. But for me, one of the numbers that sticks in my craw is that 45% figure that in a democracy where so much depends on what happens at the local and federal level, it's all important. It all is important. It all matters. But 45% of people just can't be bothered. And we need to change that zeitgeist in a hurry. This needs to become... This needs to become kind of a movement, and uh, it starts by us figuring out in our congressional districts, in our precincts, what can we do to be of use, not just to the party, but to, to everyone around us. And uh, hopefully at Swing State, we can bring you some good information to, to set you up and to get you going in, in the right direction. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, like us on Facebook, at Swing State Show, at Swing State underscore show on Twitter, and swingstateshow at gmail.com. Please do send us your comments, your opinions, disagreements, rageaholic sort of tirades. It's all good. And until next time, mobilize, organize, protest, vote.